Nine, that's pretty Roseanne Massa. My brother was Michael DeBat. Can you stand up? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Michael DeBat. D E B A T T. And my mother and I burned the $500. The day we took his ashes of my brother and put them in the urn. Yes, and Michael knew all along he was going to be killed, too. How did he know that? He was in a lifestyle that he shouldn't have been in. Things sometimes get bigger than what they are. And it's not like the Boy Scouts or a football team. There ain't no way out. So somebody was getting married. They told Michael, you got to go to Big Louie's daughter's wedding, Mike. He got dressed up, looked handsome, walked out. Next morning, they came and rang my bell. Called my mother up in the morning though. Mom, did you hear from Michael? Because my mother was sick at the time and he was stopping by her house because he was at Tally's. And we only lived three blocks away. No, bro, he didn't come home. Don't worry, Mom, he's probably out. Don't worry about it. Then a friend and two detectives came to my house, rang my bell, said, Ro, can we come up and talk to you? I said, sure. Where'd you find him? And there he was in Tally's with five bullets in his head. When was that? November 2nd, All Souls Day, 1987. So they let him go to a wedding. He whined, he dined. I guess they gave him his last kiss goodbye. Told him, go back to Tally's, go set up, Michael. Nobody went back to Tally's that night. They all went to the Brown Derby instead. I guess maybe they knew something was up. Could be, Could be. must be. And then they had the audacity to open up the mall the next day. That's right. Yes. And my aunt flew in from California, and she likes to play with the numbers. She wanted to go play now, 1102. I drive her, and I see Tally's is open. Walked in like a pin drop. It was like a church. Men sitting at the bar drinking. Said, what are you doing open? They told us to open. Well, who's they? Sammy told us to open. Oh, good. I walked over to the jukebox because that's where Michael was. I says, well, I hope you've cleared up the mess. The blood isn't in your way. Look, when you're just sitting having a drink, have one on Michael the Bat. Have one on Mikey the Bat. And I walked out. Still see these people, all of his other friends, this and that. Everybody's still in the neighborhood. That's what it is. We're all neighborhood. Do you get any reaction from these people today? Or does it never happen? Does doesn't it matter. It doesn't matter. You know, they may have murdered him. But what's it, that's what it is with all of us. What's in our hearts, Sammy or anybody, will never take that from us. Whether they were right, whether they were wrong, they were still somebody's family. And nobody but God takes, takes life. And I'm sure they all stood before God and they all got judged. They gave, they, their lives are gone. So we know what their judgment was. How old was Mike? He was 38 years old and he left a four-year-old daughter and a wife. So this is what, you know, and all of these years, we've all been doing our own thing. And we finally found a voice with Dina and Laura that they pulled us all together. If something could happen from this, all fine and good. But this is going to go on for another 10 years. This is never going to end. It's, well, we made it. It's, you know what I mean? It's what it is. And people, they always had the reaction to you. Well, that's the kind of life they lived. Yeah. Okay. Lived by the sword, you died by the Laura. sword. This, uh, what's in our heart? I'm the voice with Dina and Laura that they pulled us all together. If something could happen from this, all fine and good. But this is going to go on for another 10 years. This is never going to end. It's, well, we made it. It's, you know what I mean? It's what it is. And people, they always had the reaction to you. Well, that's the kind of life they lived. Okay. Live by the sword, you die by the sword. And the type. How's your mother doing? People don't know what to say. And you just go about your life. You raise your families, you have your babies, and you try to put your kids. You give them a good foundation. But this will never leave any of us. Right, um, 
Ron, um, first of all, you're attorney for Laura Garofalo or all the families. Can you just explain to me your sure. legal relationship? Sure. I, I'm the attorney representing the Garofalo family, and I'm also helping to serve as liaison between all the families and the Crime Victims Board. Now, do you have any suspicion that Sammy the Bull Gravano is going to profit at all from this book under so, Boston? This is the reason he wrote this book was to profit from it. I mean, you know, what, Gravano never held down an honest job his entire life. He spent uh, his entire career as a as a mass murderer, as a serial killer, and then he joined Team America and became, uh, you know, sort of a junior FBI agent, never earning an honest dollar in his entire life. So this is his opportunity to, uh, to make some money, and we're absolutely determined that this serial killer, who's now walking free thanks to the government, isn't going to profit uh, from writing this book. I mean, imagine, if you will, how the, the outrage there would be if the government decided there was some sort of use for Colin Ferguson, and they let him out of jail to walk free, and then somebody gave him a big book contract, and he not only walked free but became a millionaire in the process. People would be furious, and, and rightfully so. Okay, well, we talked at length upstairs about the, the follow the dollar, the way uh, HarperCollins and Mosh mm -hmm. tried to uh, escape the Son of Sam law, but what evidence do you have that any money from the sale or profit of this book is going to funnel down to Gravano? Who do you think Gravano's doing this for free? Gravano's never done a thing for free in his entire life. I mean, everything Sammy Gravano has ever done, from becoming a government witness to becoming a murderer, has been to turn a profit. But, but you're suspicious. You're going to have to let me fix my hair. Sure, yeah, it's sure, blowing sure. In, my, in my face. That's no problem. All right, but your suspicion is that there, the money is coming from Harper Collins, is it coming from Moss? This How do you think he's getting the money? Harper Collins is paying the money to Moss, and Moss is paying the money to Gravano. And that's why the Crime Victims Board has given uh, uh, both uh, Harper Collins and Moss until uh, March 18th to answer these questions, or they'll issue subpoenas. And if they issue subpoenas, people can sit down under oath and testify about the contracts they've made and the deals they've made. Your intention is to sue? Our intention is to sue on behalf of the crime victims to make sure that the crime victims get that money. In addition, we'll be filing a separate civil action, a wrongful death action against Gravano, and that's on behalf of the Garofalo family. Now, the civil action, the wrongful death, there are some problems in terms of statute of limitations, and you outlined them uh, early. Uh, give me a gauge in terms of how many successful actions do you even think you'll be able to file, given that these murders c occurred some odd years ago? Well, you know, it, it, it's hard to say. Uh, in the past few years, though, New York has made it much easier for victims of crimes to sue the people that victimized them. Statutes of limitations have been lengthened. Uh, there are special provisions that say the statute stops running at this point and then begins running again. For example, if somebody is living out of state or is living under an assumed name, as Sammy Gravano has, the statute of limitations stops at that point until you're able to ascertain that person's true name or the name they're living under and their address. We, we did an, uh, an interview with an legal expert who says that um, as far as the Son of Sam law is concerned, it doesn't seem likely that you'll be able to pursue those monies, but your best bet is the wrongful death action. What do you say there? Well, I think both of those are, are viable options. I think that Gravano can be stopped from uh, making any profit off of this book, and I think the families can be compensated by bankrupting Gravano uh, uh, for the crimes that he committed. I think both are viable. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> a little nervous, I'm sorry. Uh, like I was saying, uh, you know, it's been a long time trying to find everybody and trying to get everybody together, but this is something that's really important. Um, we've had to, we've had to deal with too much as far as what this man has gotten away with, Mr. Gravano, and um, we're all here to make sure that this doesn't go any further. And this is Ron Kuby, he will actually be the one handling um, the case on behalf of me and the families, and he will explain to you, I guess, in legal terms, what exactly is going to happen. What is your name? Laura Garofalo. Can you spell your last name? G-A-R-O-F-A-L-O. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you all. Thank you all for coming. It's a, it's a great honor for me to be here. Um, as you know, you know, Sammy Gravano is one of the biggest mass murderers in American history. But what makes him different from all the other mass murderers and all the other serial killers is, is this. He's the only mass murderer to be protected by, supported by, and nurtured by the government of the United States. I mean, he's the only psychotic killer who's ever been called a hero by a federal judge. And he's the only mass murderer I've ever known who's been embraced by the FBI 
and the Justice Department. The FBI has wrapped Gravano up in the American flag and called him a hero, and we're here today to try to put an end to that. I've never seen a, a meeting quite like this one uh, of crime victims, and amazingly enough, you're all victims of the same criminal. And I know that you've all been victimized twice, uh, first by Sammy Gravano, and secondly, by a government that let him walk free. And I think that your presence here today helps show the true nature of sort of the devil's bargain that the government made with Gravano. Um, Peter Moss gets up and he says, oh, those people that he killed, they were just mobsters. And even if that were, even if that were true, what a hideous thing to say. But, but it isn't true, and your presence here attests to that. Um, that every person killed by Sammy Gravano was a father, a son, a husband, an uncle, a nephew, a brother. And every time Gravano killed somebody, he killed a family as well. And he murdered out of greed and he murdered out of malice. And this is the person that Judge I. Leo Glasser called the most courageous person he had ever seen. And that's an obscenity. So what are, what are we doing about it? Well, Laura called me up um, oh, about a, a month and a half ago and told me the story of her father's murder and said, isn't there anything you can do? And I said, I really didn't think so. And then she came back a couple weeks later and said, are you sure there isn't anything you can do? And I said, well, let me think about it for a bit. And, and we thought about it and talked to some people. And what we've done is we filed with the state Crime Victims Board, and they unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, but they have been very supportive of these efforts. The Attorney General's office has been very supportive of these efforts. The Governor has been very supportive. Um, we've received the assurance of the Attorney General that he intends to pursue this book contract. <laughs> How many families are we talking about have you gathered here today? In total, okay, I think today here we have nine in total of support, including people who couldn't be here, we have 12. What about the other families, the other 10 or so? Um, 12 would bring us to seven missing, and I just clearly, I'm not a private investigator, I just clearly could not locate them. Two people were in Philadelphia, another man is not from New York, um, I just, you know, all this legwork was done originally by myself and then with Tina. Among the family members that are there, was anybody scared to come forward at all? And can you tell us about that if you were, if you thought about coming forward or pursuing this matter and whether or not you were scared to do so? I don't think being scared is a proper word. Apprehensive may be a better word. I said I don't think scared would be the proper word. I think apprehensive would be a better word. Apprehensive about what? Well, because we've, we've all suffered a loss and our families were dropped out from under us and I think that we all did a lot to try and put our lives back together and um, so I, I think that there was apprehension more than fear. How do you feel about this process now? I feel strongly about it. I do. And he looked at me the way you would look at someone else, just stone, you know, plain face, no remorse. And in hindsight, knowing that he had my father killed two nights before, I look back and I just can't imagine how he could speak to me like that, but he did. If you were, if you were to face him down in this room, what would you be saying? I don't even want to answer that question. Come on, give me the opportunity. Yes, he's probably going to see this. Because I'm a lady. A-L-A-N Kaiser, K-A-I-S-E-R. Can you reiterate the what your feelings are as far as filing all these, these actions? Uh, well, I, to profit from 19 murders, I don't care, innocent victims, not in, it doesn't matter to me. The man is an animal, and he doesn't deserve to be put up on a pedestal by anybody. And when I found out about my son's murder, the FBI wanted me to keep it hush-hush, and I guess at that point I was a little intimidated. But I'm not intimidated anymore. And I just feel he should not profit. He should be put away. And if there's any way that he can be put away, I, for one, would be very happy because this is not closure. 
When you have Charlie, somebody. How did you why were you intimidated? Intimidated you too. by the FBI because uh, they said you don't want to expose yourself. You know things might come out. You know, and it was just I had family. I had young daughters home. Well, actually, my older daughter was married. I had a younger daughter home, and I didn't want to expose my children at that point. How did you come into contact with Laura Gar Garofalo? I don't live in New York anymore. Indictments against anybody? Jackie, Jackie Colucci. My brother was Joseph Colucci, the first victim that Sammy said he did with his own hand. Uh, my brother was friends with Sammy and Tommy, a group of fellas, neighborhood boys. You know, they grew up together, but you know, they were really never that close at that time. But then, he, you know, neighborhood, they became friends. And the way I hear it, the way it was told to me 20 some odd years later, is that um, Sammy's friend was in love with my brother's wife. And Sammy 